So thanks again for coming. Um, this is one of my favorite things in the world to talk about. I don't think it's, this is working. It told me it didn't recognize the keyboard. No? And I said, it's right there. Uh, oh. Um, the advanced slide is this one here. Oh, and okay. It's back. Oh, <laughs> that's counterintuitive. Okay, down is up, up is down. So, you know, despite all of the accomplishments, I don't know whose quote this is, but I love it. Um, where would we be, right, without our soil? We wouldn't have food, we wouldn't have public health, our landscapes would be flying all over the place. Um, we need soil. This picture on the right was taken by my colleague, Peter Donovan, uh, from the Soil Carbon Coalition. It was taken this summer in Iowa. Um, and this is how we grow corn in this country. It's as, a, it's as if the Dust Bowl never happened, or that we forgot it happened, or that our farmers are under so much pressure to try and increase their yields and stay on their land that they just farm right up to the rivers again. Um, and you can almost see that soil leaving. And that's in a place in the world where we used to have, you know, 20 foot of topsoil that was left to us as a gift from the buffalo and all the ruminants. Um, and we haven't done a very good job of stewarding that soil. Oh, wrong way. Uh, so my presentation is really going to focus a lot on the soil health principles, um, which are, I think, the most important thing that we could put into policy and the most important thing that we can follow in our backyards, on our farms, no matter what size farm you have, and even on your rooftop or porch garden. These were designed by the NRCS, which is the Natural Resources Conservation Service that used to be the Soil Conservation Service. Um, and the top four were designed by them. And the fifth one was actually um, brought in by Gabe Brown, who's a really awesome rancher out in the Midwest. Um, and he's connected, we, we have him in our notes. So if you wanna learn more about Gabe Brown, you can look into those really deep notes and find his name and get some links there. So these are the five principles of living roots in the ground all year long or for as long as possible. Maximize diversity above the ground in plant species and animal species and below the ground as well in microbial life. Minimize disturbance, meaning tillage and chemicals uh, and other ways that we disturb soil. There are many, many putting pavement over top of them, etc. Minimizing bare soil, more about pavement, but also when you don't have living roots in the ground, even if there isn't pavement, your soil basically becomes pavement. So having living roots in the ground is important and also not having bare soil. So even when you're doing annual tillage, trying to cover that soil up, even if it's not with living roots, is going to be better than leaving it bare. And having animals in contact with soil, and to me, that's everything from microbes to elephants to cows to sheep and chickens and zebras. So the sun has an energy budget. Uh, and the sun is a really important part of soil health. The sun is how soil gets its energy. It's how the microbial life in the soil gets food. So this is, re this is showing you the basic breakdown of the energy budget, and I wanna focus on, uh, oh, not that, not that. I'll get the hang of it, give me a second. Okay, that's what I was looking for, you see a little red dot. <laughs> so we're gonna focus on the 50% absorbed energy here. 40 to 60% of this energy is actually invested by the trees into the root system. And this starts to get into understanding transpiration to this whole sort of circle of life of biodiversity, photosynthesis and transpiration. We're gonna focus more on transpiration in the sixth soil series event where we talk about water. I'm not gonna to talk too much about it now, but it's all connected. So the sun shines, it shines down. When it's on green growing plants, it is investing, or those green growing plants are investing most of that sunshine into the energy to feed the soil food web. Making the connection of 
the circle of life, I think, is something it's, it's kind of amazing to me that we don't do more. I work a lot with kids, and um, it's something that they're interested in. It's something they're learning about, but then we seem to forget about how important that is. And one of the things, when I work with kids, um, it, it really scares me uh, and worries me that kids are being raised to think that carbon is bad. We are carbon. Um, carbon is life. Carbon is not bad. We just mismanage it because we don't understand its cycles. But we can do better. So this is kind of what happens inside of a leaf, right? We're taking carbon dioxide and we're taking oxygen and we're turning that into sugar inside of the leaves. And that, those little solar cells, those leaves are the first solar panels, right? Um, and if we can maximize solar power in every way, and using green growing plants as one of the ways to do that, we can feed the soil. Um, going back to this slide, wait, wait. All down in that root system are gonna be billions and billions and billions and billions of organisms that are gonna eat those sugars made by the sunshine. And that's why this is so important because that soil life is what is feeding us. So I like to think about maximizing diversity as also maximizing sunlight. The more leaf surfaces we have in different sizes and shapes and throughout the year, the more we are harnessing photosynthesis. And when we harness photosynthesis, we're creating sugar out of sunshine. sunshine. Elaine Ingham, who's a soil microbiologist and one of my teachers, uh, likes to call those the cakes and cookies. So sunlight <laughs> brings in sugars, those cakes and cookies, and they feed them through the root system to billions of microorganisms that are waiting, just waiting for just the right cakes and cookies so that they can bring the nutrients that the plant wants right back to the plant. This map on the bottom right was created by Peter Donovan, um, colleague from the Soil Carbon Coalition. And these are all available online if you go to the Soil Carbon Coalition website and search NDVI maps. Um, that stands for non -differenti Normalized Difference Vegetation Index. And what that map is showing us is essentially three years worth of photosynthesis around Lake Champlain. So using technology on the internet and Google Maps and stuff that's a lot smarter than I am, we're able to capture, we can measure how much sunlight we are capturing in Vermont. And so when I see this, I see opportunity. When I look at those d deep dark green places, those are more than likely our, our conifer forests. So those are photosynthesizing year round, another great reason to have conifers. And those brown areas, some of those are places like Burlington, um, but some of those places up north, all around that lake in Quebec, those are, those are farms. And so that's showing us how little sunshine is being captured on that farmland. So when I think about the fact that a lot of those farms are probably growing cow for, uh, corn for cows, and corn has something like a 65-day window of photosynthesizing, you know, so while it might take longer to build the whole plant, the actual days of photosynthesizing and building root exodus are pretty small. And so that's 65 out of 365 days. So to me, that's an opportunity for 300 more days of sunlight. That's the way I like to look at that. You don't have to know what's happening here except to know that there's a lot happening here. <laughs> um, this one is gonna take us, I think, a little further into some of this sort of stuff in jest too. Um, so sunlight captures, the leaves capture the sunlight, turning oxygen and carbon dioxide, which is a problem, right? Too much of it up in the air. It's also capturing, by the way, water, which is also too much up in the air, 95% of our greenhouse gases are water vapor and only 4% are carbon dioxide. Um, so trapping that, bringing it down into sugar and feeding that microorganism system, that the zoo underneath the ground. Around every single living root in healthy soil, there is this tiny little place called the rhizosphere. The picture on the left is showing you just how big that might be in an area of a tree. And actually, the more we're learning, the more we're learning that that's actually much bigger 
than that. There are teeny tiny root hairs that that little cartoon picture isn't showing us, and they all have this little millimeter area around them called the rhizosphere. And in that rhizosphere, this picture over here that we're looking at on the right, oh, darn it. All these little guys, all these little red guys are indicating bacteria, and the little white guys are <coughs> indicating fungal hyphae coming in and out of the side. So fungal hyphae, uh, that's the mycelium. Have you heard the word mycelium or mycorrhiza? So this is what's literally holding our landscapes together. One teaspoon of healthy soil can have a, a mile of fungal hyphae in it. One mile in a teaspoon. To give you the kind of indication of the togetherness and the connectedness of the myc mycorrhiza, the mycelium, I like to say that we're building the social mycelium to hold our communities together because I think we can learn a lot from this really intelligent network of organisms that, are, that have been holding our planet together. So it's really exciting to me to think about the life that could be in our soil if we were maximizing photosynthesis, if we were maximizing the conditions for healthy soil and following those soil health principles. This is an indication, just a little, little map of the soil food web. It's a very, very busy place down there. And if you remove any one thing, it doesn't function well. There are predators, there are vegetarians, there, everybody is down there and they're all working together, even when they're killing each other. <laughs> um, it's, it's a wonderful place. The more I learn about it, the more I want to learn about it. Are you folks in the back hearing okay, or is it too loud? It's okay. We just want to make sure that everybody's comfortable. Okay. A little further away. Can you still hear me in the back if I'm like that? Yeah. All right. So the soil food web, one teaspoon of healthy soil. I told you it can have a mile of fungal hyphae to 75,000 species of bacteria, 10,000 protozoa, a few hundred nematodes, and maybe a microarthropod, one teaspoon. Dead soil, otherwise known as dirt, which is sand, silt, and clay, isn't gonna have any of that. And the kind of disturbance that can kill these guys, fertilizer, till tillage, um, any kind of fertilizer, in too high of an amount is gonna kill these guys. Um, so it's no wonder that our soil is dead. So can we increase living roots in the ground? Um, this is another question. I like to pose questions because I like opportunity and possibility as opposed to a wall of terror. <laughs> um, we're facing a lot of problems in the future, but I think if we harness possibility and opportunity, we can get through this together. Um, so I always like to point out uh, top left, that's a lawn, your standard single species lawn. If you had a multi-species lawn, even a con conservation mix, you might have some deeper roots from the clover in there. Um, and this is 15 feet, right? So these are uh, prairie plants from the west, but we all recognize, gardeners in the room recognize that, right, echinacea? And that one's lupin. Look at how deep those root systems go. Did you have any idea that they could go so deep? And think about the rhizosphere and the potential for a rhizosphere. And if we had that happening in our soils, when we get lots of rain, they might hold in place because there's billions of organism and mycorrhiza holding them together along with living root structures. So can we increase the amount of living roots in the ground? Can we deepen our root systems? And if we do that, will we also be deepening our watersheds? Because this is also how we get water into the ground. We can hold our landscapes in place by creating the conditions for healthy soil. And in doing so, we'll decrease flooding and drought and the potential for wildfires. We'll increase nutrient density. Uh, we'll all be a lot better off. So we can do this. Um, I'm not gonna read the slide because I hate when people do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there's, I will, the, the one on the bottom, 
I think is really important. You know, who here has an acre of land that you manage? So for every acre of land that you manage, if you could increase your organic matter 1% in the top six inches, you could hold 20,000 gallons more water per acre. There's some dispute about that number because what kind of soil do you have? Was it six inches or 10 inches, you know? But it's still a lot. So some of these figures are still under dispute because we're learning about them. Um, but the point is we can increase a lot of water holding capacity in our soil by creating conditions which include following the soil health principles. When we don't follow the soil health principles, this is what happens. So this is a picture overhead view of what Long Island Sound looked like after Hurricane Irene. And what you're looking at there are Vermont's farm fields and dirt roads um, gone. Connecticut River. Yep, Connecticut River. So $800 million in infrastructure damage, but not one penny was considered for how much soil we lost and what the value of that was. How do we start measuring that? And is it important? Is it important to hang on to soil that takes a long time to build and that farmers have been working so hard to build and they didn't know that if they tilled their soil all the time, they might not have the mycorrhizal network to hold it together. We can change the way that water moves through landscapes simply by increasing the soil sponge. By increasing the health of our soil, we can influence the amount of water that infiltrates into our soil and holds in our soil to get us through times of drought. This little cartoon is just giving us an indication that when you have good ground cover, you get a lot of infiltration and not a lot of runoff. So the, these full jars are showing us runoff, not infiltration. It's a little confusing. Um, on the right-hand side, clearly, if you're all paved, you're gonna lose all the water and it's gonna run off and overfill your jar. And if you have a forest, you might lose a small amount of that water when you get a lot of it and it goes beyond saturation point, but you're gonna be able to hold on to it a lot more. So can we turn our cities from something, oh, what was that? <coughs> oh, there it goes. Oh, yeah. Sleep. I don't know. Can we turn our cities into something that looks more green? And it's happening. People are doing this. There's really exciting stuff happening with vertical gardening and rooftop gardening and more parks in cities and impervious pavements and water catchment, there's a lot that we can do even in our urban areas. And where we are in Vermont, there's a whole lot that we can do. So when, when we treat water like this on the top right, I think my mic stopped working. Fine. <laughs> We're good. Yeah, just close to there. When we have water like this on the top left, and by the way, that was taken at Thetford Elementary School where I managed the school gardens, and on July 1st, 2017, we had that rain event where we got like seven, hour, seven inches in a few hours. Um, we had 12 feet of water in our schoolyard above the drain and it formed the coolest um, funnel. So I took a picture of it. Um, that basically creates ocean dead zones. When we look at the picture of the Long Island Sound after Hurricane Irene, all of that is headed down to the ocean dead zone which I just learned is now the size of Connecticut. I was taught it was the size of Rhode Island. It's growing. We can do rain gardens. That one is from up uh, Burlington, um, Davis Center, uh, UVM. Um, that's just a really cool experiment to catch water coming off of their parking lot, and they're using it to grow plants and deepen root systems. Can we provide more ecosystem services? So this is showing us this, this little picture here. Just look at the green petals. On the left side, natural ecosystems provide us with all the ecosystem services we need except for crop production. So what do humans do about that? We come into that center panel and we create crop production at the expense of all other ecosystem services. So can we move more toward the one on the right where we're growing crops and we're providing ecosystem services. So what are ecosystem services? Pollination, 
beneficial insects of any kind. There are 900,000 insects identified on the planet, and a very small fraction of those are actually considered to be pests to humans, and a smaller percentage of that are actual pests to agriculture. Yet, we have killed off, I mean, have you heard of the in insect apocalypse? That was all for a fraction of a percent of insects at the expense of all the other ones that provide who knows what kind of ecosystem services that we've never even acknowledged. Clean water, clean air, surface water temperatures. These are all different kinds of ecosystem services, having landscapes that hold themselves in place, ecosystem service. So all the things that we need from this incredible planet that are provided for us that we don't know how to make money off of, <laughs> although we keep trying. We're genetic engineering bees. Don't worry about the bees. We'll make new ones. Um, so can we provide more ecosystem services? This is a question we can all ask ourselves on our porch, in our backyard, in our neighborhoods, statewide, et cetera. Can we start to mimic ecosystems? What would it be like if we mimic ecosystems? I find this picture very inspiring. And below it, look at the beavers. Did we learn that pattern from the beavers? Can we learn any patterning from the beavers? If we had left the beavers alone, and if we could create the conditions for the beavers to come back to manage our water, we might not have such drastic flooding effects next time. Because beavers have been managing water for as long as beavers have been. So can we shift the system? to provide multiple ecosystem services like you're seeing on the left. These are actually a lot of Vermont farms, so we're very lucky where we live, but let's not forget not everybody lives there. And on the right side, this is the kind of agriculture you generally support when you go to the regular grocery store and buy meat or dairy or vegetables. On the left side, and you're buying grass fed, you can buy, you can buy all kinds of food and support ecosystem services for the planet. It's all about how the food was produced. Can we measure impacts and outcomes? We like to talk about a lot what's in the left-hand side, and we can calculate damages, but we don't even really do that well enough. But can we start to plan for outcomes? Can we start to plan for more plant available water, stream base flow, purity, groundwater quality, recharge, surface water, et cetera? Can we focus on that? Can we put a value on that? And can we begin to hire land managers to produce those ecosystem services that we all benefit from? And not just that, that we all actually need in order to survive. So following those soil health principles, that's how we do this. And I like to say principles and not practices, because practices limit us. They create barriers. They create tunnels and we, we stop innovating. When we, when we hold to principles, there are all sorts of practices we haven't even thought of yet that can help us employ these principles. And I think that's it for me. So um, I just always like to provide some takeaways. These will be in the notes. Um, I'd like to move on and let um, Jess come up. Jess, Ruben. Thanks, Kat. Every time I, can you hear me? Yes. Every time I see a presentation of yours, I think I need to follow you around and just <laughs> learn a lot from you. So, so much to learn. You should be able to. So down is maybe the mic is off. Can, Can you hear me? Get a little closer. Yes. If it's too loud, just let me know. So before we begin, I would like to well, as part of the beginning, I'd like to just acknowledge Please adjust the mic. It's oh. I would like to acknowledge that we are on the traditional and unceded territory of the Elnu Abenaki, the Nolhegan Band of the Kusak Abenaki Nation, the Abenaki Nation of the Masiskoi, and the Kuasek traditional band of the Kus Abenaki Nation. These are the four federally recognized tribes in Vermont, and there are also other Abenaki who are not recognized. And just want to honor, they call this land Adakana, Dawn Land, and they are living in a place with colonial borders created by government entities called New York 
Vermont, Canada, and they do not have access to their native homeland traditions in the way that they, is their inherent right due to these colonial borders and laws. And I just would like to say that because we're here and the mission of Vermont Healthy Soils growing the mycelial network and creating a new paradigm, part of the work is acknowledging that and holding the reality that there's a lot of pain in the soil here because of the history of those people. And so as we learn how to heal the soil and the water, we're also looking at those relationships and how do we heal our relationship with those living people today and their ancestors. So the overall lens um, that sounds like we're all aligning with is this regenerative agriculture principle shifting the burden to the intervener. And as we well know, our species is still trying to figure out how to be a good Earth community member. And we have disturbed a lot of systems that were uh, working beautifully um, before we got here. And so we are, we are responsible to try to do the best to fix it. When I try to approach that overwhelming task, I go back to geologic time and I want to acknowledge that there's many different views of creation and forms of time and creation stories that have as much validity as science. I am going to be using the scientific paradigm today just because I found it very helpful in ecological restoration. Um, those other ways of looking at creation and time are also as valid. So according to that uh, scientific paradigm, life on the planet is around 4.6 billion years old. And the microbes showed up around 3 to 4 billion, and it was a very uh, gaseous and hot and um, difficult environment for creatures, but these extremophiles were able to live with sulfuric acid and hydrochloric acid, and they were able to live and reproduce and make the habit, the planet, a bit more habit uh, hospitable as water began to condense. And as they did this, can you hear? Yes? Can you hear me? <laughs> check, check. Can you hear? Check. I'm not familiar much with microphones. Check, check. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> okay, so as the microbes made the, ha ha the earth more hospitable, the fungi showed up not that long after, two billion years ago. And these fungi partnered with the microbes, and they were able to help the earth environment become even more hospitable as water was condensing, and it was only a billion years later that the plants showed up. So I you know, bow to these creatures because they are our ecological ancestors. And so when I think, okay, how do we repair our mess, I look to them and I say, well, they kind of know what they're doing. How do we align and partner with them? We're going to be diving a little into the OA horizons, which are about the top four to 16 inches down. And this is where the highest density of plant roots and soil organisms are, the microbes, the fungi, and plant roots. And one thing I just want to point out is that the fungi bridge the microbes and the plants. And um, that role is really critical, I believe, in the earth repair work we're doing. So as Kat had mentioned, this sphere around uh, roots is called the rhizosphere and it has an incredible capacity, 10 to 1,000 times increasing soil and nutrient absorption and access. And when it partners with fungi, it becomes the mycorrhizosphere. When we look at the soil food web, it's amazing to see the interspecies communication, the interspecies collaboration. And it's a great model for our community of how we can rekindle and honor the interspecies community that we're a part of. Just a brief dip into the biology of fungi. When you harvest a fruiting body, it's like taking an apple from a tree. The roots of the tree are like the hyphae. And the hyphae are the vegetative structure of the fungi. They are the biggest part of the fungi. They are the part that I will be focusing on. They're where the nutrient exchange networks are, and they are the ones that are involved in a lot of the um, enzyme releasing, nutrient capture, and um, healing work. You often may have heard the word mycelium, which is when there's a lot of hyphae, and um, I won't get into biology of that too much right now. Uh, an interesting thing about fungi is they're closer to us than plants, 
um, and they respirate like us, they take in oxygen, they release carbon dioxide, however, they have an external digestive system, so they release enzymes ahead of themselves, and one of the amazing things about them is they can take very complex molecules and break them down and make them accessible to life that other creatures aren't able to access otherwise. It's interesting to note that their functioning is very dependent upon water, and Kat had mentioned about water being part of the greenhouse gases, and it's, I've heard that the spores, there's billions of them in the air, actually create surface area for water vapor to gather on, congeal, and return to the water cycle in a more efficient manner. The gist of fun fungi ecology is that they really provide balanced ecosystems. Just like when we learn to take fungi as medicine for our bodies, and they help return us to balance, so too in the ecosystems. They can decompose and recycle, they're dead life, plants and animals have a lot of micro and trace nutrients that get released when they die, and the fungi can uptake them and release them back into cycles. Toxins are able to be denatured into benign elements, except heavy metals, and, and move them around, and as I mentioned before, bridging nutrient networks. They're sort of like the janitors of the earth with microbes, but we don't want to lean on them too heavily. The fungi I'll be just briefly talking about, I'm not going to mention pathogenic fungi, but sap saprophytic fungi, like these black trumpets on the left, oh, where the, uh, are, um, they break down cellulose and lignin in wood and absorb nutrients from dead animals, as I mentioned, and plants. And they're the ones that are very capable to heal soil and water. Mycorrhizae are also wonderful healers in partnering with plant roots, and they release a chemical called glomalin, which was discovered in 1996, we'll talk more about that, which acts like a glue, holds soil aggregates together. Um, they mineralize in organic matter, and they're very helpful in preventing erosion. So we're gonna focus on mycorrhizae fungi, and around 90% of plants on Earth are mycorrhizal, and I mentioned a lot of this already, um, I think what hasn't been mentioned is that they do improve crop yields and can really help restore and rebuild food soil web. And originally, before the Industrial Revolution, before we were disturbing soil, mycorrhizae was everywhere. It's, it's as if the fungi nervous system of the earth has sort of been ripped apart. We have the internet and computers now, but the original nervous system got ripped apart. And so a lot of those natural fertility cycles were disturbed and were in aiming to re recover them. The Arfus there, there's two main categories of mycorrhizae fungi based on the way that the fungal cells associate with the plant cells. The arbuscular or endomycorrhizae, which are the ones on the left of this photo, you can see that um, on the outside is where the, um, excuse me, on the right side, they actually penetrate inside the plant roots and about 80% of the plant families partner with them. And those are the ones you will mostly find in fields, in gardens, in prairies, and they're with most flowering plants. The ectomycorrhizae are more on the surface of plant roots, and those are the ones that more are in the forests, partnering with conifer and hardwood trees. And that's about 10% of the plant families that they partner with. Um, arbuscular mycorrhizae, as I mentioned before, release this gooey glycoprotein called glomalin. And glomalin is fascinating in that it seals off intercellular spaces and basically allows soil to aggregate, to clump together. And this clumping basically provides a rigid space for hyphae to penetrate through the air spaces between soil and for water to settle in. And remember when Kat showed us that slide on the far left where very little water was leaving that landscape and it was acting like a pool? It was because that soil had a lot of um, this glomalin in it. And it also is about 30% carbon in organic matter. So it's really, I don't like the word sequester, but it's a way of storing carbon. It helps store carbon and hold it in the soil. Um, when you have well-aggregated soil and rich microbial diversity. As mentioned, you're gonna have more wa water holding capacity, more aeration for some of the microbes that do respirate in the soil because obviously you wanna keep growing so microbial diversity in the soil. 
And these nutrient exchange works of the hyphae can take off even more. And um, of course, erosion will happen less because soil won't want to leave. It has such a great place to stay. So need to know about glomalin. There are small heavy traces of heavy metals, even in healthy soils. And um, it can actually prevent soil from carbon from decomposing in a century. And when heavy metals are not present, glomalin will actually sort of store comet carbon in a way that allows soil micro microbes to slow. Get your switch, maybe. Can you hear me? No. Can you hear me? No. Okay. Oh boy. Now? Is it all the way up when it's on? All right, I'll speak loud. So, can you hear me? Yes? Okay. Our organic matter is preserved and it's like a slow release so plants can access it over a long period of time. Um, as the as the climate is warming, which we all know, there's increased CO2 in the atmosphere. And one of the benefits of this it is that um, glomalin um, will actually increase production when we have more CO2, and hyphae will grow more. So it's just so interesting that they're actually almost like helping correct um, you know, this anthropogenic forcing of greenhouse gases. Um, and there's a, the woman, Sarah Wright, who's a scientist in 1996 who researched and discovered glomalin with a team of researchers, had um, said that the same thing will happen when you just uh, manage soil in a good way, which, go figure. Um, and a longer hi-fi, obviously, can increase the rhizosphere, more water, less erosion, increase soil fertility. Uh, so a couple ways that you can easily add fungi to the landscape. You can build hugel cultures. You can take wood, store it on swales, on contours, so you're catching water going down, and you're sequestering or storing carbon, and then you can grow perennials or edible or medicinal fungi in it. You can uh, inoculate mulch in your pathways with fungi, food and medicine, that will also retain moisture and, and protect the soil microbial diversity that's in continuing to grow. You can add mycorrhizae inoculants to places in your community that are clearly um, more monocultures, such as recreation fields, golf courses, lawns. And when you're planting on your land, you can do dips. The land you tend, you can do mycorrhizal dips of your plants and trees in, in these mycorrhizal um, products. Farm fields, they can definitely use this, and actually, farmers, if they use this, will not need to add as much phosphorus inputs or fertilizer inputs because they're going to have all of those ecosystem services of the fungi, and in the long term, it'll also protect the watershed health. Um, so very helpful for degraded landscapes. Um, so one thing, when I was on the beach a little while ago, I saw this um, stinkhorn popping up when I was looking at these uh, sand dunes that were going into the ocean and thinking about all oh, the sand dunes like hang on there and i saw these little hi-fi holding s s uh, s sand particles together and then little succession of lichens and then this popping up and it was like oh of course you're here you're always on the edge of where we're losing ecosystem and i don't yet know it's it's you know biological functions but i was just like fascinating so what we can do is we can partner with protecting them you know no rototilling don't compact soil, don't over fertilize. You use a broad fork instead. Key line plow, you can sheet mulch. Do enrich your soil with quality compost, add mycorrhizal to roots of species, plant with species that symb symbiosize, I don't know if that's a word, with mycorrhizae, <laughs> made it up today. Keep soil covered with cover crop or mulch and incorporate charged um, biochar. Biochar works wonderful with fungi, creates surface area when you charge it up with urine and other compost teas, it's amazing. So I'm just gonna briefly touch on, how much time do I have? None? Yeah, we're good. All right, we're gonna go through this in a second. Uh, <laughs> micro fire remediation using microbes, micro remediation using fungi, phytoremediation using plants. Um, it's all about chemistry. Basically the fungi recognize the toxin and you partner with it. You know, fungi know how to break down lignin and cellulose trees. Petroleum, guess what? It's a hydrocarbon. It's also a, a CH bond. And that happens with all these other species. So there's a whole system of how you do it, just matching up things and creating substrate. And be careful with heavy metals, because those are ones that are more complicated, but you could do with hydrocarbons and 
and pathogens and excess nutrients like phosphate and nitrate. I think in this watershed, you have too much nitrate going in. Where I live, we have too much phosphate. Mycorrhizae will actually uptake it and redirect it into plant cycles and get it out of the water. It also breaks down all the crazy chemicals that we have floating around in the, in the um, ecosystem. I won't get into the watershed where I live, but just like the watershed here, it's in a lot of trouble. And same story of why your water, where you live, this watershed is in trouble, our watershed's in trouble. This is a study that uh, the, the service that I help facilitate did with UVM. And we basically focused on working with a fungi to try to remediate E. coli because there's too much E. coli because farms don't have support to manage their manure. And um, we found that we actually did decrease the E. coli. However, we have nutrient questions. There's a lot of questions about nutrient cycles. So there's a lot we don't know, um, but we do know fungal mats work, but we know less than we do know. And um, I'm not going to get into all of it, but there's implications where this can help with stormwater design and rain gardens and repairing buffers. And we have a couple projects going on in Colchester, in Castleton, and hopefully Shelburne Farms if we can figure out the funding trail. Um, I encourage everyone here, and I imagine a lot of you already do, partner with the fungi, go to the forest, listen to them. Um, they're waiting, they're our elders. Um, develop relationships with them. Fungi language is different than plant language, but it's similar, it requires us to be humble and listen. Um, I already mentioned all these things we can do with buffers, mycorrhizae, fungi. There's so many industrial agriculture point source places that need it and stormwater runoff and large scale farms that could benefit. The youth and the public need to know about it. Textbooks have like one paragraph about soil, maybe a line about fungi. Um, and then research, like everyone in here is a citizen science. We need more people on deck. Mycology is actually like a very new science, which is like kind of ridiculous when you think about how old they've been here. Um, so we need like everyone on deck. And there's another fellow here, Jesse, I think, who grows a lot of mushrooms. And we have a group here, Myconode, and we have a lab and lots of resources. We'd love you to come join us. It's open to everybody. Um, these are a couple of great resources. Um, to get both products and education. These are a couple books, and if you want any scientific articles, I could fill your inbox, so feel free to be in touch. Mm -hmm. And we don't have time for questions because we want to hear from Juan, I think, right? <laughs> so thank you. Sorry. Oh, and there's a final survey. I was going to say, while well, I set one up, will you do that? Okay, one last thing is that we have a survey. We're trying to get a SARE grant for one of our projects. This is for farmers, and we, it's, it, I know farmers have to fill out a lot of surveys, um, but this is short, and it's just to find out what you need for support to learn more about implementing micro-remediation projects on your land. So if you would be so kind as to use it to fill it out, it'd help us when we write our SARE grant to say, see, there's a need for this. Um, so there's a stack of surveys up here. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you for inviting me to this whole series. This is amazing. Um, I want to thank um, Kat for choosing a picture of me 15 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and I also want to say that um, to Jessica that um, I've been doing a research with um, eight sources of compost and I'm looking at fungi and, bac and bacteria and um, we'll talk more about it but uh, interesting results um, about the amount of fungi and bacteria in different sources of compost. Uh, basically, it went from commercial to um, homestead, residential, dairy, uh, sheep, compost, uh, beef, two beef farms, and um, amazingly, residential and Johnson Sioux, which is a new, new to some uh, form of uh, uh, making compost, where they once that have the most bacteria and fungi. Okay, so um, thank you for having having me. Um, today I'm gonna talk about uh, what does farming with nature mean? And I'm kind of getting into in a deep water here because I'm gonna tell a story about uh, one of my mentors, um, one of my professors when I was living in Brazil and I did my uh, college there. Uh, he was one of the pioneers in um, rotational grazing in the Americas. Um, and I want to start with a provocative question, you know, can you read in the back? So, what is the difference between these two photos? This and this. Ten seconds. 
fundamental differences. Petroleum powder, what, what else? Scale. Scale, okay, what else? Sustainability, <laughs> manure. Yeah, Maybe all good. Intense. Intensity. Yeah, we have a 300 horsepower tractor versus a one horsepower uh, <laughs> manual plow. And what is the difference? Energy. Energy, yeah, all right, you know, all right. And I will say that the one that uh, is missing uh, is the time to plow the area. Okay, these can plow a um, hundred acres or more in one day. Okay, versus you know this beautiful horse here. Okay, so uh, by doing that, what what are we doing? We are disturbing the soil. We are turning the soil and making it. Uh, enhancing soil respiration, and when we do that, we free carbon, just like a kid loses a balloon into the air, okay? So um, the faster we do it, you know, the more soil we lose, the more carbon we lose, and when we disturb this, the carbon cycle, we disturb the water cycle, and we disturb the nitrogen cycle and other biogeochemical cycles, okay? I don't want to get into jargon here, but uh, just to, so this is, this is the symbol. And uh, as Kat, and I, I must mention that I'm using some of the photos that you used, or some of the pictures that you use in your presentation, you know, just by chance, you know, we're all on the same page, basically. But uh, I want to, can you guys hear me? Is the microphone working? It just got turned off. Yeah. I've just been wiggling it. <laughs> so, Try it now. Yeah, there you go. Hello, hello, great. So um, today's agriculture, so I'm not gonna add more than what Jess and um, Kat said, but basically in order to produce food, we need to clear an area. So we slash and burn, okay? We, we provide a packet of you know, uh, irrigation, silos, we dry the seeds, we commercialize. And um, the problem with that is that we're not producing, with this model here, we're not producing food for humans, we're producing food for animals and for storing as uh, a resource in case we run out of food. But today we produce more than double of the food that the world needs. So we're good at that. Uh, we could take a break and, and maybe slow down a little bit because um, this picture here in Brazil, I counted about 28 combines and, and they are harvesting soy, not corn. And there are, machines, no-till drilling, um, the next season. In Brazil, they can do sometimes three crops in a year, okay? Uh, because of the climate and amazing soils that were forests before. And most of this food goes to feed animals in confinement, okay, which is cruel, um, using cheap fossil fuels and leaving behind contaminated um, water that we can drink or, or swim or fish and guess what we subsidize all that and produce you know very cheap fast food with that so uh it's this is a model that is not sustainable and i'm going to repeat some concepts that were said by by cat but this is not a basketball this is a grain of sand the next one here is a silt grain and this dot here is a clay. So very distinct sizes. Again, top soil, full of life, predators, rhizosphere, have you heard those con con concepts before? Rhizosphere can amplify the reaches of the roots and it interconnects, like Jessica was saying. But today, we are living in an unprecedented crisis. Why? Because we are more people, therefore there is less land per capita, land per person, okay? And we are losing soil at an unprecedented rate. 
2400 tons per second. second. Like every second. Okay? And it's not me who's saying this, it's foul and it's very old, it's like 10 years old or more. Okay, and we are desertifying the earth at a rate of 1300 hectares per hour. Okay, this is no, no joke. Okay, so it's like losing a Costa Rica sized country every year. But not only that, um, every 11 hectares of soil are still under expanding cities every hour in Europe. Okay? So I, I, I don't want to scare you with this, I just want to bring reality here. But this is a, a crisis, you know, we have many civilizations that disappear because they didn't take care of the soil. And um, what are the relationships between uh, soil and health? Uh, for instance, some ecosystem services provided by soil. Um, so cyanobacteria, which can be a culprit of some in some cases, produces uh, about 50% of the oxygen and is indirectly responsible for the other 50%. Some microbes make uh, antioxidant. Uh, some microbes trigger neuron formation. Some microbes uh, break down calcium oxalate, and, and that means if you have kidney stones, you probably have a deficient microbiome, so on and so forth. So those are those are uh, benefits from soils to human health. So we have been mining these soils and um, we learned a lot from um, the, great, um, the times of the Great Depression where um, uh, there were dust, dust bowls in this country and, and in many other cities in the world. But dust bowls still exist today in many countries, like Australia, um, like in countries in Africa, there are dust bowls, you know, sometimes weekly. So that's soil blowing away from their place because there's no cover, okay? So um, you can look at soil, um, soil work as soil mining. So we are mining for nutrients. And there's a metric that says that ever since the end of the Second World War, we have been losing minerals and vitamins at 1% per year in fruits and vegetables. Okay? Pretty dramatic. But dramatic. When you see uh, big apples or big uh, uh, fruits, um, they probably contain uh, the, the normal macro elements which make possible for them to grow well, but they may not have the traces, the trace elements that are uh, important for many uh, body functions like uh, you know, hormone formations, uh, many other uh, functions and processes in, in, in the body. And uh, so as such, you know, we are reaching several planetary limits uh, such as climate change and nitrogen, nitrogen um, use, uh, biodiversity loss at unprecedented rates. And we are losing biodiversity at a very high, high rate. Um, about a thousand times higher than the background rate. Okay. And I, wanna, I wanted to bring this, um, this slide that shows um, the evolution. This, it shows um, price indexes in percent. And these are uh, years, 1970s through 2015. And looks, look at the fertilizer price versus food price index. They're almost identical. So um, that means we have a heavy dependence on, the, on fertilizers. And when one goes up, the other one goes up too. And that's a bad habit. And I'm gonna show why it's a bad habit, okay? Um, I think as this slide has misplaced, I wanna, I wanna start with this slide first. In 1960, uh, Dr. Pinheiro Machado was, was my, um, I mean, he was my mentor in the 90s when I did agronomy. 
Okay, but he was the first one, one of the first one, he was the second one to start the rotational grazing in Brazil. And maybe in the, Amer in the Americas, okay? He bought a farm that was, um, that had sand soil, not sandy soils. Okay. These were the, the, the soils before he started. After running animals through these, uh, through these uh, fields, all the soils started to get covered. And can someone tell me what are these uh, bumps here? Manure. Manure, urine. They're called ghost patches. So this is five years later, okay? And um, because he was a he was a, an academic, he measure he measured his soils, and he looked at organic matter. So in 1959, 0.19. This is extremely low amounts of organic matter. So, uh, phosphorus, soluble phosphorus, less than one ppm. Total phosphorus, not available at, at that time. Uh, potassium, okay, okay 2.15. 1993, this went up almost eight times. And phosphorus went up 16 times. And potassium went up 33 times. And then they measure again in 1999 and compared to his neighbor here. And his neighbor was still doing continuous grazing versus rotational grazing. Now rotational grazing, you move animals fast from one pasture to the next pasture. Uh, how many farmers are in this audience? Uh, two, hey Jan, <laughs> great, three, awesome. So you move animals daily and you put them in a um, relatively, um, relatively uh, small area and you change them and the area rests until they come back, rest um, in a dynamic way. Um, depending on the time of the season, it rests for 14 days to 40, 60 days sometimes. And um, that way you, you occupy the same area for five or six days in a year, basically. <coughs> Okay, the thing is, um, all this happened without adding fertilizer, so where does the extra phosphorus and potassium come from? That's the question, and, oops, hold on. And then I'm gonna talk about nature's secrets, and I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna dare to talk about these four ecosystem processes that tells you that we can farm with nature, using process-based agriculture in term, in term, instead of input-based agriculture, okay? So on here, so soil processes, uh, you didn't have this slide, um, but basically every time we disturb the soil, we are uh, really destroying uh, the habitat of many, many uh, microorganisms, macro, <coughs> micro and macroorganisms. Um, I remember when my, my grandfather used to plow the land, um, he plowed the same land every year. At the beginning, lots of birds would come and, and, and eat bugs and, and uh, worms, etc. And um, I noticed, um, you know, after some, many years that, um, you know, no, no birds would come because there's no life in that soil. Okay. And his yields went down and down and down. Everything is interconnected. So, uh, Dr. Pinero Machado said um, that he started establishing a theory for why his soils went up in these elements without adding fertilizer. So, he came up with biocenosis, with, which is a dynamic development of soil life only if the soils are not disturbed. Okay. And he came up with, with that theory before 2014, uh, 2004. So every time you, you move the soil, you destroy those connections, those interactions between those organisms. And you become dependent on external inputs. Okay. So um, I'm going to skip this slide because Jess and, and, and Kat already spoke about it. 
The second theory was the trophobiosis, which um, was coined by Chabuzo in the 1980s. And trophobiosis is a mix of three words. Trophy means food, bio, life, and cis, development. So basically, the, develop, the development of life via food, basically. Makes sense, right? And he wrote a book, Healthy Crops, A New Agricultural Revolution. And basically, the gist of it is that healthy plants, or plants grow, grown in healthy soils, they grow complex sub substances that uh, Jerry Bernetti used to call them funny proteins. Okay, those are complex su substances which offer a barrier to pat pathogens. Okay? So pathogens, on the other hand, are a few insects, a few, a few, a few organisms that have, um, they lack enzymatic capacity to attack plants that grow in healthy soils, okay? They need enzymes, but they don't have enzymes. They, they don't have all the enzymes needed to attack those plants. Um, but they will attack plants with highly soluble sap, which are the plants that drink soluble fertilizer, you know? Ex synthetic fertilizer, okay? Go? Okay. And then the third process was um, the ethylene oxygen cycle, which um, was coined by Widowson in 1993, Australian. And uh, this happens in the microsites, which are the soil pores where uh, root hairs live and absorb nutrients. And basically, he said that in these um, micropores, there are sometimes oxygen and water, and when there's oxygen, there are aerobic organisms, aerobic bacteria, and with plant uh, activity, these uh, aerobic microcytes get oxygen depleted. So um, these microorganisms go dormant. When they go dormant, anaerobic bacteria wakes up and releases ethylene. By releasing ethylene, iron, goes from ferric, insoluble, to ferrous, soluble, loses one charge. And guess what? It frees other metals, like phosphorus, potassium, calcium, okay? Droplets of, droplets of nutrients. So here we have three types of soil, uh, soil sponge, middle of the road, and a break, basically. So, yeah, so soil needs pores in order, to, in order to accomplish these important processes. And then the fourth, ouch, transmutation of elements with low energy, uh, coined by Kerbrand, you know, Louis Kerbrand, a French, a French person, um, which means um, low energy, energy nuclear reactions can transform nature elements into different ones. So you can turn carbon into gold. It's, that's what he said, okay? Or uh, Bibrian, uh, another French uh, scholar, uh, studied and um, studied uh, the, 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 the papers of Kerbrand, and he said that biology is not only a chemical process, but also a nuclear one. Um, basically, um, elements in the right, with the right soil conditions, with the healthy soils, are able to change into other elements. And as bizarre as it may, th may, may seem, you know, uh, this is the fun fun foundation for cold fusion, basically. Transforming some elements into other elements is a theory, but it may, may sense. So some examples of these, um, transmutation of silica into calcium. Uh, there was an experiment that Kervan did with uh, chickens. He fed one pound of oats, and um, which was high in potassium and low in calcium. And when uh, these chickens uh, laid eggs, the eggs had five times the amount of potassium. And he said, oops, what happened here? So another experiment done by a, a, a Japanese a scholar, Mizuno, um, Transmutation between, um, from 
sodium into potassium. So he, um, he seeded some fungi, inoculated into 100 grams of sand and clay medium with, zero, uh, with um, 0 0.006 grams of um, potassium oxide. And after 72 hours, he harvested three, uh, 36 grams of these inoculated uh, fungi. And he measured the potassium, and the potassium was 1.58 grams, 300 times more. How can it be? So uh, my, uh, where does the extra uh, phosphorus in, in, in potassium came from? Key thing is this process here that is um, responsible for the extra amount of potassium because he didn't add anything. Basically, um, and I'd like to you know finish with the soil health principles um, because they support all these processes. Manage manage more by disturbing less, basically. Diversify crop uh, diversity to get above and below ground um, uh, carbon. Grow living roots as as much as you can and keep the soil covered as much as possible so that it's an um, armor to the surface regardless of the use of um, moisture, etc. And I'd like to leave you with this quote, <laughs> just to... Thank you. Thanks, um, Juan. Thanks, Jess. Um, that was great. Uh, so we went a little over all of us, I think, on our presentations because we just love to talk about this stuff. Uh, so sorry about that, but I hope you enjoyed the information. And we have 20 minutes officially left. I'm happy to stay longer if people want to stay past 8.30. But at this point, this is when we need to get to know each other. I don't want anyone leaving the room without knowing who was here because we live together. We face a climate emergency together, and together we have to fix this mess. So um, if we all just get up and don't know who each other are, how can we do that? So please stand up and make a circle with your chairs. <laughs> as best you can, as best you can, circle, circle up. big circle. Um, so um, what I'd like to do now, um, we don't have enough time for Q&A. We never do. Um, if I had planned four hour evenings, you guys probably wouldn't have come. So we're keeping it short and packing it in and we want to stay connected as we move forward. So what I'd like to do now is have us go around, say who we are, where are you from? And then share with us either something you were moved by, uh, hopefully related to tonight's presentation, um, and maybe leave us with a question that probably will not get answered. But we have note takers that are keeping track of all your comments and questions. And all of these comments and questions help us to guide what we're going to do next. So your question will not ultimately go unanswered. It's going to help us shape what do we need to do to help prepare our community to start acting toward the resilient future that we need rather than waiting? We are the ones we've been waiting for. So let's introduce ourselves. Uh, I'm Kat, and I'm totally inspired that you're all here. 
um, it really means so much. And it, it means uh, that we're onto something and that we have great energy. And every time we do this, I'm so inspired by the people who show up, the skills that you bring with you, the knowledge, the passion, the connections, and I leave feeling like, we got this. We can do this. Hi, everyone. I am Vanessa Brown, uh, formerly of Bethel and currently of Montpelier. And what else am I supposed to share, Kat? Um, um, a statement or a question, what you're feeling after all this, or? Yeah, um, well, I really respect soil scientists and um, uh, really interested in learning more about fungi. I've always been interested, but haven't really um, spent a lot of time learning about it. So I really appreciated Jess's presentation tonight. So. My name is Ronnie Salter. I live in Randall. Uh, I don't live on a farm, and I did live on a tree farm for a long time. Okay. Can you, can you yes. just point that at your mouth? Yes, but that's what gets it all fuzzy. Oh. Yeah. Well, well, we want to hear you. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, I'm Elizabeth Seiler from Burlington. And I'm inspired by all the people in the room. And also by the feeling that I don't have to figure this out alone. That is a huge relief. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Jesse Markson. I'm living in White River Junction right now. I think one of the main things that really inspires me at the moment is just the fact that uh, mycorrhiza is one of the dominant uh, contributors to soil carbon. And I guess my open question is how can we continue to manage land and perennial food producing ecosystems while cultivating these fungal partners to maximize soil carbon sequestration? My name is Keith Walsh, I live in Bedford Center. Um, in my journey of starting to understand uh, what's going on in the soil, the first person that I reached out was, uh, to was Kat Fox. And uh, the couple of years, I would say now, three, four, five years after reading Dee's book is what turned me on to the whole thing, uh, really um, so incredibly inspired uh, by the information that I've learned and, and really am feeling incredibly hopeful in understanding that uh, the, the speed at which we can turn around some of these things that we've been degrading uh, is really feasible and within our grasp, not just because of the volume of people in here, but because Mother Nature works that well. I'm Cassidy Murphy of South Royalsmith. Um, I totally was inspired by all the science. And, um, and really kind of really got into that part. My question would be is, how do you share that information with people who aren't so much into the science? And to be able to teach them to do things that are simple. Hi, um, I'm Tammy Jo. Um, I live in South Royalton. And I'm just really excited about having conversations with my um, landlady about what we can do in her yard. Jesse Scarlato, my player. Uh, definitely learned uh, some new things about soil processes today that I think I'm integrating into what I thought I already knew. Um, and also thinking a lot about uh, land management and what drives land management decisions and how to kind of get there from here. My name is Karen Montgomery. I also live in Montpelier and um, I learned a lot this evening. I've been a gardener of vegetables and flowers and fruit trees for many, many years, but now I live in a condo and we have a small yard and I, like Tammy Jo, am wondering how I can convince my fellow uh, neighbors to be as enthusiastic as I am to not have the lawn mowed and make it all plants. <laughs> Hi, I'm Lynn Wild. I'm from Montpelier also. Uh, it is really good to see this many people interested in this topic. I just, I cannot tell you 
Jesse Markson a few minutes ago, and uh, if you haven't had a really easy introduction to regenerative agriculture, this is a fabulous book. It's got so much great economics and, and science. And My first ever book on tape. Really? Oh. Well, we put it in the Montpelier Library, hopefully. I gave it to them yesterday, but I gave it to everybody I know, so I'm hoping to saturate the stuff with really, anyway, uh, My question is, um, Working on the Montpelier Tree Board uh, in, in uh, Montpelier, obviously, um, there's a lot of focus on dealing with invasives, including uh, Norway maple and uh, crazy snake worms, and of course emerald ash borer. And I just wonder if, and this is really a philosophical and one of those life questions. If we were so focused on taking care of regenerating our soil and making it healthy, would we really need to deal with invasives? Would we just could we just kind of just let them be what they're doing and we would get the soil taken care of? So that's the question I'm looking at right now. I'm Shelby Gerard. Um, I live up the road in Brookfield. Um, I also work for Rural Vermont in Montpelier, and um, I must say that um, I'm really impressed both tonight and at, at the other um, event within the series that I've attended that folks came from quite a distance to be here and I think that's really special. Um, I don't do a lot of events in Randolph and I think mostly it tends to be Randolph Brookfield Brain Tree folks so this is really very cool. Um, I also wanted to say that I just really appreciate the the upbeat um, nature of these events um, and that they're very hopeful because it's really easy to get mired down in the gloom and doom when talking about such big issues that we're all facing. Um, and um, it feels good to leave these events with um, just with hope. So I thank you, Kat, and everyone. Hi, I'm Laura Simon. I live in one of the villages of Hartford it's called Wilder. And, uh, I've mostly been a social worker, doing organizing most of my life, and um, a little bit of music about the earth and uh, teaching. And I've uh, started doing uh, some working on my friend's permaculture uh, property. And, but this learning about soil is new to me. Uh, I've been working on climate issues for a while, putting a lot into that. So um, it's good to see you all and think about that maybe uh, soil is part of what we have to focus on. So make some positive change. Hi, I'm Stephen Monks, and um, I live in Stratford. And uh, I guess the question I would have is that, that I've been growing vegetables for a long time, and I have about an acre of gardens, and um, I till. And um, it would be, I, I can't even imagine how I would garden <coughs> not till. So, I mean, I would love to do all of this, because I love the soil and I love the earth. But how do I do it? No, I would use hard work. Um, I'm Laurel Stevenson from, um, from, um, I'm Laurel Stevenson from Hartland, and um, I guess I'm inspired by how quickly uh, we can get culture back where there was stability before. And my question is, how, how do we get people to be not afraid of microbes? <laughs> um, my name is Kate, and I live in South Burlington right now. I'm originally from the Plymouth area of New Hampshire. And it's cool that this area has this kind of thing going on. I really appreciate it. Uh, going off of what you said, I work uh, in a hospital, and so it's like constantly like sanitizing and getting rid of like bugs and stuff. And I really like talking about how awesome they are. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Sandy Gamor. I'm from Heartland, and um, I yeah, I can't wait to get myself a uh, a, a broad broad shoot. Fork, <laughs> so that I'm not tilling so much and 
disturbing things. I think that's what I'm getting clearer and clearer about. Um, and I, I too have that question about invasives that was brought up, and there's so much talk about it, getting rid of them. And um, so I'd like to hear more about that. Hi, my name is Jeff Corbett. I'm originally from Rowan County, but right now I'm living in Burlington. And first of all, I'd just like to say I'm grateful for this space to be here with all of you today. And my question would be, how can we reach um, those who are working like three jobs and apparently don't have a lot of time? Is, is this going to be available to them? My name is Jeff, and I'm living in Richmond right now. And um, the information about transmutation was very interesting and um, curious to learn more about that and also we'd love to talk to people about emerging natives or uh, emerging plants that are called invasive as a group of my doubt I would put my and stormwater design outside of schools I'm just curious about children getting involved in that all over the state. <clears throat> my name is Gary Gerr. I'm a farm boy from Illinois. And in Realize how I was screwing up the soil by plowing the land. And I'm going to take a little credit for running the, what we call the honey wagon. <laughs> it had the manure on it. Um, I'm extremely impressed with the speaker tonight and the depth of their knowledge. I'm extremely impressed by the number of people, by the people here. I'm overwhelmed by the magnitude of the problem. Hi, uh, my name is Penny Smith. I live in Beth, and I've seen some of my neighbors here. Huh? Good to see you. Um, very excited about being here tonight and the fact that this group is looking at soil. Uh, I am extremely concerned by um, the use of glyphosate products in the state, and um, we're owed reports on um, that usage, and the governor has yet to give us those reports. Mm -hmm. And how can we know even the scope of the problem if our um, reports, which are mandated by the legislature, are not being produced by the administration? Mm -hmm. So that's just kind of a shout out. Ask the governor to get those reports out. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and when we're looking at soil, you just cannot avoid the issue of glyphosate. It kills the soil. You know, Monsanto has a, a patent for antibiotic for glyphosate because it kills everything. And so I really think that, you know, um, with the prices that conventional farmers are getting for milk, and that whole financial crisis, I would just encourage anyone who has a heart for this issue to try to work on ways to get farmers to transition away from using Roundup because it kills. And I think the market is going to do that for us. Second court case has, has been found against them. Only 11,199 <laughs> to go. So, you know. Things are looking good there, but you know we're, we live in a small state, and if, if just the people in this room would write the governor and say, "Where's that report mm -hmm. on pesticide use in the state?" We'd probably see a little action on it. So <laughs> good to see you guys. Uh, hi, David from Randolph. Uh, like everybody else, just really impressed with the uh, wealth of material presented tonight. I'm glad the information is being transcribed. Uh, I'm not being a scientist. Uh, we got a lot of homework ahead of me uh, just to try to understand this all a lot better. Uh, but um, uh, great that the critical research is going on out there. Okay. Yeah, I look forward to the notes. I can try to understand it better. <laughs> I'm Pam Overstrom and I live here in town. And um, again, I see the magnitude of the problem but I'm hopeful because of the work that is being done. So um, I go away hopeful. 
My name is uh, Gene Palte, and thank you for the three presenters. I thought they were awesome. And I think the quote <coughs> that really got me was that very last quote that fellow had up there <coughs> about uh, what we know already keeps us from learning. I think in my case, it's true. I, I'm a, a raised vegetable in the same spot uh, on a farm with my wife for almost 30 years. And uh, we're always trying to tweak things. And, uh, I'm really excited to learn about this mycelium stuff. Also, as a note, we, we've been experimenting with uh, nematodes as, uh, as, uh, as to target a soil organism that we deem uh, bad. And, <clears throat> um, and thanks a lot for putting this on. Um, my name is Jen Colby. I'm from Randolph as well. Um, I'm a colleague of Juan's at UVM Center for Sustainable Agriculture. Um, so a question that I sort of been hearing in the room is what actions can we take? And as a person who works with farmers a lot, I can certainly encourage folks, please change your backyards, but please buy from farmers that are treating the soil the way that you want the soil to be treated because they need your help. Um, and at the risk of sounding really self-serving, our farm is a mile away. <laughs> we raise grass-based lamb, and uh, we protect uh, both the Ayers Brook and um, the White River because we're in between both of those. So keeping the soil covered is pretty major in our book. Could you say the name of your farm? Yeah. Uh, we're Howling Wolf Farm. And, and Jean, could you just say the name of your farm? We are a Tunbridge Hill Farm. Um, Matt from Tunbridge, and uh, I'm just interested in growing a bunch of fruit and uh, nut trees pretty soon. And I just realized I needed to learn a little bit more about the soil, so this is kind of a good first step. But pretty interested in the concept of swales and Google culture tonight as well. Hi, my name is uh, Cynthia Queen. I live here in Randolph, but uh, we are going to be getting kind of started with the Randolph Community Orchard. With planning at the first five orchard and also we have some property in Bethel that we've already started planting trees on but we our soil really does need help so I was glad to learn about some of these options or, or the principles <laughs> the principles and I guess my question would be where can I get the presentations that Juan Alves did I would love or just the references I would love to uh, you know, delve into some of that a little bit more. One okay. question I'll answer. Sure. Make sure you sign up on the email list. Okay, great. And they'll be in the notes. All right, thank you. Hey, I'm Andy Quinch. Uh, where you carry uh, uh, My question is, uh, we bought a property that is, let's say, 10% uh, uh, of the 30, 40 acres of open pasture and it's on the border of the idea on the uh, My question is, this uh, pastor was uh, abandoned for maybe 30 years, something like that, 30, 40 years, and nobody lived there, nobody disturbed the soil, but the soil is created. Like, we planted a, uh, an orchard that is Starting to grow up now, uh, we um, soon we try to introduce some animals to uh, try to revitalize the soil. What what happened? I I mean that I understand introduces a lot of invasive. We have monoculture of uh, uh, strong vegetables. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what happened? Hi, I'm Megan, uh, living in Tunbridge. Um, I was very excited, uh, particularly by Jesse's presentation. I am a mushroom forager, originally from Ohio, was a mushroom forager there as well. Um, and and I, I agree that um, we can all spend more time getting to know our fungal ancestors. Um, one, I also have a similar question to Jeff, um, about how we can 
increase the access of this type of knowledge and experience um, to places elsewhere. I'm originally from Cleveland, and I can tell you that this is not how it is everywhere. <laughs> and um, Vermont as a whole is definitely a pocket. Um, and, and I wonder how we can um, increase the access to this in places like Cleveland and Vermont. Uh, my name is Carol Gordon. I just moved to Cambridge as well. And um, yeah, I'm inspired by this fact that life is really uh, made possible by this small layer of six inches, if it's six inches at all. And if you think about the short length of our small atmosphere here in the universe in which we all live, then I'm, I'm still, I'm kind of shocked, my background is in biodynamic agriculture a little bit, and I'm kind of shocked how much we need science to tell us how important and vulnerable life is, and that we shouldn't degradate soil and stuff like that. It's, I mean, um, it's been a topic uh, since a few years now in my life, and I'm still, I'm still uh, shocked by that fact, and I, I think if we were more come back to like value-based system as, a, as already in those principles, then we might even get climate change deniers who would still are believers in religion and stuff. And what we really need is this cultural shift in which we like to work with the soil and don't run away from it. And I've been, of course, very inspired by my new very in that kind of thinking. Hi, I'm Ty Cochran, and I live in, on a small farm in West Hartford. And uh, I was hugely inspired today by a phone conversation that I had. I worked uh, in the 70s and 80s. Uh, I lived in Montana and worked with a group that was promoting the use of renewable energy. We called it alternative energy back then. And uh, I happened to, and I realized that uh, I love learning this stuff. I think it's wonderful. It's just so encouraging. And I realized that it's a huge problem and not everybody uh, knows about it and, and, and I, I want to spread the word like man. I had this phone conversation today with some friends in Montana that I used to work with on renewable energy and I asked them what they were doing and this is what they were working on too. So I was very encouraged. Everybody all together, thank you, Black Grin. Is, is she back there? Thanks for dinner. Thanks, Mike. the moment. <laughs> Mike Bald, uh, Royalton. Um, I do invasive species management without chemical methods, um, from Lake Champlain to Cape Cod. I've been doing it since 2010. Got the inspiration from Massachusetts. I always mention that. Um, this was a brilliant evening. Thank you to all the travelers and presenters. Be safe on the way home. Um, went to the Pesticide Advisory Council meeting today. I was the only member of the public there. That says something. Um, I did submit to the leader of the council, where are the reports on pesticide usage that stopped in 2013? We've got five years of data. I was in the military, I was in the Forest Service. You never have enough people, you never have enough money to get the work done. You give me the numbers, throw them out there on the floor, you give me the numbers, I'll bring you the people for free. And we will make five years of reports for free. That's free labor. So, I mean, I see how many people are in this room. I told them I have 10 people. And if they put the numbers on the table or on the screen or whatever, we will make the reports that they don't have the people to, make, to work with. And, and they did say, yeah, well, that was cool. And they were receptive to that, although it was all, they said, well, it's all about it. It's an IT issue. So, that was, so, so now I have to go get my, it, it, they change systems. But that's, that's that, it, no, five years, that's not a legitimate excuse. Um, and I think people have already asked tonight as well. Um, if you want things to grow, I ask people this all the time. They tell me, what do I do about the knotweed? What do I do about this? I say, well, do you want things to grow here or not? Oh, yeah, yeah, we want things to grow. 
Well, then why would your first step in management be add toxin? I mean, that's why would you move backwards if you want to move forward? So I don't want to blah, blah, blah too much. Um, yeah, build soil. Uh, ask your, I, I don't talk to the governor. You go talk to the Senate and the House Agriculture Committees and ask them why in the past three years of hearing from some guy from Royalton who makes a lot of noise, why do we not yet have a cure for Lyme disease so we can work the land without curling up a little, a little ball at the end of the night because we can't move our bodies anymore? Um, why don't we have a cure for Lyme disease? And why do Vermonters burn, this is on us, why do we burn 40,000 piles of unwanted vegetation a year? I prune apple trees, and they always ask me, I'm going to this guy tomorrow in Woodstock, what do I do with the vegetation, Mike? Do I burn it? No, the planet's hot enough and you have kids. So all those branch tips, that's next year's future soil. 40,000 piles a year, I did the math. And that's something that this group can change. And people should get paid for not burning their, so their branches. That's enough preaching from me. Yeah. I just want to point out the time uh, as facilitator. We're 10 minutes over. Totally cool with me. That's it. Time to. I'm Kep. I'm from Williamstown, a uh, home gardener, and um, really glad to be part of this group. I hear new concepts um, every week, and I just write down that little concept, and I go home and I do a little research on it and get more jazzed about it. But one thing I just wanted to put out is my friend Kai came and she lent me one of her books. And so the idea of sharing books and information that we all have resources at home that we could share with one another. So I would just like to encourage you, maybe we could figure out a way to communicate that and share. My name is Karen and I live in East Bethel. And I come every week and every week I learn a little bit more and it's starting to coalesce somewhere in there. And like we said so many times, I'm really hopeful that so many people get a dance. I'm Brian Tokar from East Montpelier. Uh, I'm a climate activist and an educator and have been gardening here in Vermont for about 35 years. And even though I was a pretty serious science geek in an earlier phase of life, my approach to gardening has been mostly more experiential and intuitive. And I'm just really inspired by the presentations tonight to think more about how to I roll back together. Hi, I'm Aaron. I'm from Randolph. I'm um, just an avid home gardener looking to maybe potentially expand it into maybe a small farm. I'm still exploring that possibility. Um, it's been really interesting seeing so many different people from all over the state, it seems like. Um, I don't know that I really have a question. It's just still kind of a lot to digest and think over. Um, and thank you all for putting it together. Hi, my name is Joelle. I'm a farmer, organic vegetable grower in Worcester, Vermont. I've been farming for about 16 years. Um, I know about a lot of this stuff for longer than that. Um, and I still can't believe we're farming the way that we farm in the Midwest. Um, and I know a lot of people mentioned invasive species, and that's the symptom of our industrial agricultural system when we're shipping food across the world back and forth. I'm dealing with an insect called sweet midge, um, which came from Eurasia a couple of years ago. Um, but I also work for 350 Vermont, and we're doing a climate walk um, April 5th through the 9th. Thanks. <laughs> I'm a little brain dead. Um, and walking from Middlebury to Montpelier, and we're going to be highlighting some of these solutions along the way. I think Kat's going to come do a presentation. So hope some of you can join. Thanks. My name is Carl. I'm the co-founder of Soil for Climate. We're honored to be one of the sponsors um, for the series. Um, if anyone's interested in following this discussion at a global level, I encourage you to, if you're on Facebook, to join our Facebook group. We have over 10,000 members, over 100 countries around the world. So it's been very exciting to watch the emergence um, of communities around the world who are interested in, in these topics. 
Um, I recently saw a talk by John Kemp of advancing eco-agriculture, and one point that he makes, which I found kind of revolutionary, is thinking that all insects are beneficials, and that when your plants are attacked by insects, it's nature's way of eliminating from the food supply plants that are not nutritious enough to be consumed. <laughs> Um, hi, I'm Vanessa Rule. I'm from East Stratford. Um, and I was, I'm inspired by the soil. <laughs> and everything that's going on in there um, it just blows me away to know about it. And I think you've done an amazing job at pulling this together. So thank you. Um, and that, you know, I want to echo, I guess, that feeling that this is how we need to change things, I think, is building these connections and biomimicking socially. Um, and at the same time, I'm holding the despair of knowing the machine out there. And I work on trying to get decision makers to transition to renewable energy all over the country with, you know, moms, like, organizing and showing up. And I see, like, how organized they are on the other side. And I hate to put it in those terms, but we are, I, it's, I don't know how, how we stop the machine. Because, you know, that image that you showed of the, the tilling, the scale, or look at the scale, right, of this room versus what's out there. And I guess, so that's my question. And I hate to be a downer. <laughs> All right, Debbie. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a really important question. Maybe we don't need to fight directly. I don't know. But we, yeah. This is a start. Yeah. Just think of how small those microbes are. Mm. And what they're so, able to do. Yeah, oh, yeah they're able to do it. <laughs> My name is Nancy. I've got a small homestead um, outside of Bells Falls. And I was really struck by the, the quote, was it you, Jess? If you screw it up, it's your responsibility to fix it. Yeah. Um, so I'm sitting on this really, really lovely piece of land, and I don't want to screw it up. And what I don't know it's driving me crazy, so thank you for this because it helps me learn a little more. And you know, there was a piece of my land in that slide going down the Connecticut River into the um, Long Island Sound after Irene, and um, followed by all of the uh, knotweed that came in <laughs> after it. Um, so yeah, we're, we've got forces outside of ourselves that are impacting our ability to care for our land, and this helps us know more about how to do that. So thank you. Hi, um, Tatiana Schreiber. I live in Westminster West and have a little farmstead there too. Um, and also uh, teach, try to teach about ecological agriculture and um, also work for the Rich Earth Institute in Brattleboro. That's doing work on uh, using, uh, diverting urine from the waste stream and using it as a fertilizer. Um, so I'm very interested in, I want to make a connection with Jess there, very interested in um, what I learned tonight about, or I want to learn a lot more about uh, micro remediation and all that sort of thing. Because um, I've always been very interested in soil and soil diversity and all of that stuff, but really understanding it better and what all these critters are doing and how they're doing it is really interesting to me. But um, something that's come up a lot, or come up in my mind a lot tonight is um, this whole question of the relationship between scientific uh, ways of thinking and other ways of knowing. As you mentioned just in your talk, um, how, do we, how do we include all those ways of knowing together? and speak across of those different ways. Because I think it's really interesting that the science, at least for me, is so fascinating. And I want to learn more. And, and that's, a way from, that's a way that I really like knowing. But other people have other ways, and it doesn't work for them. And so how do we really cross those, those uh, differences and bring them together? Um, that's really interesting to me. And also, I just want to say I really appreciate what people have said. It sounds like there's kind of a shift going on in thinking about invasive species, and I'd really like to see us really change our way of thinking and talking about these, um, these uh, plants that are just coming here, and it's not their fault. They're just like doing their thing. I don't want them to be blamed. I think we need to think about it, another way of thinking about that.
Hi, my name is Beth Champagne, and I used to live here, but I've been up in St. Johnsbury now for 20 years. And this is the most wonderful evening. This is the third time I've come, and I do intend to get back the next two times. I'm sitting directly across from my old neighbor in North Randolph <laughs> and seeing lots of other people, um, either that I'm excited to listen to or that I know from one place or another. And um, Jen Colby up there told me last year that her sheep were able to get rid of all the so-called poison parsnip, which is really mm, not parsnip. poison. It's something to do with photosensitivity. Yep, yep. And so, you know, when Seven Days ran that long article saying, oh, there's just nothing you can do about it, I was not impressed. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is, it's just phenomenal, the people that are here tonight from so many different towns and that we all care enough to show up and, and learn and get acquainted. Um, my big takeaway for tonight, and this is pretty, well, it's, sad and it's funny too, that this is the first time since I started reading all these books like Cow Save the Planet um, that teach you about soil. I'm going to hear Carl talk a few years ago, I think it was a 350 Vermont mm. annual meeting at the Old Grange Hall in Montpelier. This is the first time that I really feel that I can get into my garden and not <laughs> it took me a long time. <laughs> I'm Steve Herbert, and I live in St. Johnsbury. I was really excited tonight to hear um, a subject talked about um, of um, biotransmutation, especially by a, a university professor. <laughs> yeah, Transm one, he's special. Transmutation of one element into another. Um, I would like to know what, what he knows about a similar phenomena, like what air plants do, uh, taking uh, elements in homeopathic amounts and multiplying them in quantity. Uh, be really excited to hear that too at some point. <laughs> Thank you. Juan Elvis, your neighbor from Essex Junction. Um, I want to say that I'm not impressed with the amount of people and the energy in this room, because after all, this is Vermont, and that's what we do. We get together to you know, support a cause, and <laughs> we really do it. So um, thank you Pat, for hosting these, and for and John as well, um, and everybody. Uh, one thing I want to say is, one thing I want to say is, um, take responsibility for what we do, and one of the ways that we can take responsibility is, I'd like to um, support what Jen said, my co-worker. Um, if we can, can we, I mean, the question I have is, can we think about buying one farm product per week, you know, no matter what, from a different farm? You know, I think we're gonna be better off, our farmers are gonna be better off, uh, we are facing a tremendous crisis right now in uh, dairy. Uh, and the other side of the coin is that crisis can bring opportunities. And I see these groups you know, popping up in different places um, as a great ferment for a change. And uh, I, I'm hopeful and um, it makes me proud to be to have chosen Vermont as my home, home place. Good evening, my name is Nanko Hamid, I live here in Randolph, and uh, I'm very impressed about learning all about soil and soil restoration, and I feel like that's the future of agriculture, and like we have to incorporate all these no-till methods into our, our agricultural practices, and uh, yeah, I wish that we could learn how to uh, grow in a I feel that conventional agriculture has to evolve into like you know, till methods and, and how to conserve the soil. Um, that's it. I am John from East Randolph. I want to say I'm grateful to Kat, Jesse, and 
one for tonight's presentations. They were really terrific. And I want to make a plug for a uh, free home orchard workshop in May at the uh, Randolph Community Orchard <clears throat> up near Exit 4. It's sponsored by Bales Resilience University. And uh, Nico Rubin from the East Hill Tree Farm in Plainfield. Hi, my name is Scott from Randolph, and um, I want to thank the Earth for putting up with us. <laughs> so, and now that I know that the soil's alive, I'll have somebody else to talk to. I learned last week, I went to a conference on adding large woody debris to rivers. Um, and there was this really interesting fact that came about, which was that beavers have effectively been removed from Vermont since 100 years before the first European settler mm. came. Mm. So we actually have no idea what our landscape should look like. I think that that's really like, mind boggling to me. And I thought you guys would appreciate it. Um, so Lauren, Lauren has been taking notes for us for all this time, so if you're reading those notes or getting those notes, it's highly due to the fact that Lauren has been typing wow. the entire time. Thank you. Um, thank you all so much. Um, this is really great. Our next one is April 10th. That one is about resilience. We'll have Simon Dennis, Mindy Blank, Henry Harris, and Chris Wood as our speakers. Uh, and then the last one of the series is April 24th, and that's about cooling the planet with water. Carl Tiedemann here is gonna be on the panel, along with Henry Swayze, Judith Schwartz, who wrote the book, uh, Cow Save the Planet, um, and Jan Lambert, who also wrote a book that's in our raffle, and she's a wonderful person. You'll hear more about beavers from Jan. Um, and May 8th, that is so important that you come on May 8th, because that's where we're gonna start getting to work. And we're gonna keep working, and keep working, and keep working. We have to keep showing up, we have to. Didn't you say we were in Montpelier May 8th? Oh no, May 8th is here. May 8th is here. Okay. Um, but you might be confused with another thing I'll tell you about. So there are so many events going on. You should, if you have events that you know about and you want other people to know about, please write them down. We'll make sure they get in the calendar that we share with everyone. But just today, we booked the State House Lawn for May 6th at 11 a.m. And Vandana Shiva is gonna come and speak. So, save the date, it's a Monday. And uh, yeah, so that's happening. Um, 350 Vermont, I just wanna put in another plug for their climate walk and also, Check out their website. They have so many cool events happening right now, really focusing a lot on solutions. Um, they're doing great work, so, so plug into them. Resilience University also is a really great place to learn. Um, there are lots of small towns doing sort of skill shares right now. Support those. Those are your neighbors sharing their skills, and that's what we need to get out of this mess. So thank you so much, and um, We'll see you again. If you want to help out by putting a chair away, that would be fantastic. <laughs> <laughs>